Um, so uh, Greg Bloom is the executive director of Open Referral, uh, which is a really interesting idea uh, for us in the 21st century. Um, we have tools that are out there like DNS, uh, email, healthcare exchange records that allow for information to go through the tubes that are the internet uh, and get to the other end fairly safely and secure. Uh, and you can exchange information like these are whoa, right? You have HTTPS. Whoa, this is amazing. These are protocols that essentially run the internet. Uh, but now that we're moving on to using technology and data to improve social services, open referral is a really great idea that is being experimented. Uh, and uh, Greg is going to talk about that. Um, and I'm looking forward to seeing how open referral can be implemented. Um, and uh, yeah, he's going to explain open referral, and then we're going to get into some questions. Great, thanks. Thanks. Thank you, Noel. Thanks, everybody. Oh, build up with people in here. Um, first, I want to actually really thank Noel and Beta NYC and also Civic Hall. Um, I travel around the country a lot. It's a great privilege to do so, but this has really been a tremendous community. They've welcomed me in. Um, I'm so excited about all the different things that are going on here, and this is a great privilege to be able to use this space uh, and meet with this network um, and discuss these issues. Um, uh, just a brief uh, correction to Noel's introduction. Uh, I am uh, not the executive director. Open Referral is not an organization. It is much more of an idea. It's a a little bit of a movement. Um, I'm sort of like the lead instigator of the Open Referral Initiative. Um, I saw an opportunity, um, I carried forth a message, and now we are in the process of trying something new for a very old problem. Um, and by way of a little bit of background, I'm, I'm not really like a business person or a technologist. I'm more of a community organizer. Um, I gather people together and help them discuss uh, common problems and identify potential solutions. And uh, I came to this particular problem that we'll be talking about today uh, by working for an organization that was actually in my neighborhood in the District of Columbia called Bread for the City. It's one of the oldest social service agencies uh, in DC. It's also very large and pretty comprehensive and uncommonly well run. Uh, they are the biggest food pantry in the district. They also have a medical clinic. They have a whole posse of lawyers um, and they have social workers. And um, I was the person, I was communications guy, which they meant marketing when they hired me and I approached it like community organizing. Um, and I get calls at my desk about all kinds of things, um, including like, what are your services? What do you provide? How, you know, how do I actually get in to your uh, organization? And it was also my job to maintain the website and I knew that this information wasn't actually easy to find on our website. Our website is designed as most nonprofits are to get donations. It has pictures of people and uh, kind of phrases and a big donate button. And if you want to figure out how to access the medical clinic as a new patient, you have to click like three times in. And that's actually pretty good compared to most nonprofit organizations' websites. Uh, if you go, much less a government website, if you actually want to find actionable information about how do I access the resource that's provided here, it's pretty difficult. And so I'd often answer these calls and I'd often get calls from directories, uh, people asking or just auto sending me automatic emails to update our own information. And I did this the first couple of times. I actually tracked down all the information for every one of our programs. Um, and then the next time, like it would take me an hour because we had like four different departments at two different facilities with like 30 different services. So it was it was a lot of information. Um, the second time I did it, it, things had changed. And I realized this was actually going to be a huge problem. And nobody cared if I did it or not at my organization because we were already overwhelmed with demand. So it wasn't like updating all of these different directories and all of these different websites uh, and call centers was really important. And that's sort of the root of the problem that we'll be t talking about. And I think it also points to the, the potential solution. Um, the directory data is just very specifically, because open data conversations are often pretty complex. Who's providing what services? Where are they accessed? When can you access them? The facts about this these various kinds of public services and, and human services. Um, and this is like a really wicked problem. These are the most words I'll put on a slide uh, through the course of this presentation. I just wanted to show like there's a lot of different aspects of the way we provide services to people in need that make this especially tricky. Um, 
organizations, it's not like Yelp, where you can like say, I want Chinese food, and you see the Chinese food restaurants. Organizations often provide many different services at different facilities. Sometimes those facilities are owned by other organizations. Um, the hours of the facility might be different from the hours of the actual service that you can get there. Um, this, in aggregate, makes for a big mess. Um, and you also don't really have the nice uh, uh, potential uh, solution, which is an executive order to open up all the data that we've often seen a couple, at least in, in a few domains in government. Um, this is nonprofit services often. Uh, they're, they're not necessarily uh, accountable to any one particular institution. Um, so what we have is just the, a giant field of which there's like ad hoc dispersed accountability and the, the data that's available, the information that's available sort of reflects that chaos. Um, so here's actually a little bit of an example. Uh, it's kind of fuzzy on the big screen. We pulled this from uh, three different directories that we're working with in San Francisco. Um, the Community Awareness and Treatment Services Incorporated is otherwise known as CATS, which is its listing in the San Francisco reentry uh, printed booklet. There's a guide to getting out. It's 400 pages long. They list it as CATS. The Bar Association of San Francisco has a different booklet that lists it as a woman's place. Um, and those two list this as a 24-hour service, whereas here you actually see down here that the intake hours are uh, 4 p.m. to 6 p.m. on Tuesdays. Right? So this is, these are all being produced by different people in different organizations. Um, that are trying to develop the means to help people find their way to services that can improve their lives. This is what that looks like. Um, basically, everybody is compiling different directories for different purposes with pretty much overlapping information from the same sets of services. Sometimes with a special focus, sometimes designed for service providers, sometimes designed for people themselves seeking help, sometimes actually for researchers, people doing public health. Um, and as a result, because everybody's basically, actually I'll just talk a little bit about this field specifically. Um, in the 90s, uh, an, a model for actually connecting people that, to this information emerged called 211. But this is actually the culmination of decades of organization among a field of referral providers that are associated under the Alliance of Information and Referral Systems. So there's about 1,200 professional organizations that um, collect all this information and deliver it to people in various ways. Um, and my organization actually wasn't doing this because they were paid. They weren't really a professional referral provider. But that's how I, I would say most people manage this information is just ad hoc on their own. Uh, and then increasingly, over the last 10 years or so, we've seen web-based startups, most of which are for profit, who are developing very nice looking interfaces um, designed either for social workers or for end users. Um, uh, and when I started this work, there were three of them. Now there are about 12. It's a, it's a growth industry for sure. But the challenge that they're all grappling with in isolation from each other adds up to a tangle of misaligned incentives. Organizations ultimately are not trying to get more people to come through their door because they're often not compensated per person who comes to them. Um, and if they are compensated per person who comes to them, they say, say things like, we provide all these services, we serve like, you know, they will actually sort of overinflate the different kinds of things that are available uh, at, their, at their organizations. It's very different from a market where you can simply set up a directory and you expect organizations that want more customers coming to them to actually report what it is that they're doing. And the people who then collect this information, if it's a part of their business, if they're investing resources in the collection of this data, they actually probably are pretty protective of that data. They want people coming to that information through their own mechanism, through their own website, their own call center. And so they're not necessarily inclined to share it with others. And all of this is actually rational organizational behavior. That's a really important thing to emphasize. These organizations are doing what they can to get the resources that they need from funders. And those funders' agendas then sets the terms of those programs, sets the shape of the information itself. And this is really a systemic problem that doesn't just affect 
people in need. It also affects service providers who spend all their time chasing down this information. Um, and they hardly know who to trust about where to refer people who need more than the services than they can provide. Um, it's also hard for funders, decision makers themselves, researchers and analysts. Uh, I can't tell you how many like pub uh, community health initiatives I've heard of where they're like, well, we need to build a resource directory first before we're really able to understand the health of our community. And there's like 10 existing resource directories already around their community. Um, and of course, it's hard for the civic hackers who will show up to the hackathons. I'm sure you've heard it at your, ha at your hackathon, whatever it may be. We're going to build the resource directory like one-stop shop app. Um, and those issues come up all the time because ultimately, where do I go to get help is perhaps like the most important question for most people when you're talking about using data to improve people's lives. Oh. <laughs> so like, here's the thing. People often say to me like, well, okay, we'll just build the app that's better than all of those other apps. Get the killer app that wins the market. Suck up all the data and then people will come to you. Easy peasy. Or if it was, it would have been done already. Um, and more importantly, that mentality has actually ended up fragmenting this field more and more over the course of the last 10 years. You get more vested interests who are trying to win, trying to become the killer app, um, and it ends up becoming a situation that technology is actively even making worse. It's much easier now to build a resource directory. Um, it's not any easier when it comes down to it to maintain it. Um, and so we still have chaos actually proliferating. So here's the thing. We envision a world, an open referral, uh, uh, in which this information is like air, like water. I, I actually think Noel's analogy to like email and DNS is, is a really good one. This should just be ambient data. You should be able to access it and use it in all kinds of ways, not through one particular app, through whatever tool works most effectively for you. Um, it essentially should be infrastructure which is a concept that I think we've lost sight of in the enthusiasm about everything that technology makes possible. That infrastructure is a thing that's actually built not for one particular demographically desirable user that you can optimize for and then capture and then think about everybody else from your platform. It's built for all purposes. And that's very difficult, but very vital. So we're basically, through open referral, saying that's possible. And how could we get there? And I, our hypothesis is that there's a few components of the bridge to that world. Um, a common language, a, a, a standardized way of describing services that all the different information systems can recognize. Interoperable platforms, meaning tools that can talk to each other. Systems that, through which this information can, can be exchanged. A community of practice, errors, the, the Alliance of Information and Referral System is a community of practice where people share information about how to effectively practice it. it uh, uh, this, this art and this craft uh, just so happens that AIRS is designed around an industry model where these are organizations that are trying to own this data. Um, and like most industries, they haven't quite figured out that the internet has actually flipped that on its head. Um, and we need sustainable models, ultimately. We need uh, uh, systems that are going to be able to exist in 10 years, regardless of um, uh, the funding streams that may come and go. So we have at least one precedent for this in the modern sort of civic technology space, Open 311. Um, and this is what I would, had been learning about at Bread for the City when I realized that like, this was a potentially solvable problem. Open 311 was just emerging. It's a common set of protocols for calling center systems that municipal governments operate. Um, I'm sure you're familiar with 311. Uh, uh, people are less familiar with 211. Um, 311 is like, I, I have, there's a pothole here, uh, there's a, a, a rat infestation. Uh, 311s can refer you to services um, if you call. They're really an all-purpose line, but their specialty is like, there's a problem and the city has to deal with it, so we're going to take that information and make sure it gets dispatched. And the Open 311 initiative addressed that particular problem, said we're going to establish common protocols for describing issues that the city has to deal with as reported through their 311 line. Right? And by doing that, they took a field that had been like six or seven different vendors of 311 systems um, and created a common language that applications developed for 
one system could be redeployed in others, right? And you went from a, basically a fragmented field that was just like a bunch of like vendors like Motorola and all these like large corporate interests who were essentially capturing these different city contracts. You went from that to an ecosystem in which you could build a special bike lane and bike navigating app that could communicate with the city's infrastructure, right? Something that um, only like some civic hacker would be able to dream up themselves, wouldn't be able to come from a city's uh, internal technology shop, but would be really valuable. But here's the thing. Um, a man named Justin Grimes pointed this out to me pretty early on uh, when we were talking about a platform that everybody could uh, use. For that, you'd need a language that everybody could use. And this is a little bit of a collective action problem. right? How do you get everybody to agree on a language that would be beneficial for everyone if everyone used it, um, but for every individual like player who's actually in the game, they're like, oh, I'm not going to do that. right? And this, is like, this comes up in every conversation that you have with cer a certain kind of technology guy. They will point you to this comic. Um, and here's the thing. I actually think the key word in this, because this is real logic, right? This, this is like, I'm not going to wave this away. But the key thing here is the competing standards, right? In a field where essentially the values are defined around competition, then yes, stand, like developing standards that everyone can use, it's going to be really difficult. And the conventional wisdom is that the only way you can achieve that common language is by winning the market. Right, so Google, for example, proposed a language for structuring information about transit data. It's called the General Transit Feed Specification. And if a transit agency publishes its data in this format, Google um, uh, will show it in Google Maps. Um, but everybody's going to use that. They have a lot of incentive to do that. Google has essentially won that market. And so when they say, we're going to use this language, everybody follows suit. Um, but the question was, in DC, when we realized like, we p could cooperate among the different organizations that um, uh, produce this data, we realized like, that's a little bit beyond our capabilities ourselves to develop something new that everyone suddenly would agree to. But then there was an opportunity that I observed. So this happened around 2013. Google, through a consortium of search engines known as schema.org, uh, which is like Bing, Yahoo, all of these different search platforms get together and agree on language for the web. Language describing entities and their relationships to each other. And this has already been applied for things like movies. Um, I pulled out some helpful uh, screenshots of Paul Blart, Mall Cop. You can see the rating of the movie. You can see the cast, the director. Uh, you can see that it's a prequel to Paul Blart, Mall Cop, Part One. Um, this is like this is all very helpfully delivered information about movies, and you'll also get the same for rec for recipes. If you search buttermilk pancakes, you'll come up with differently rated recipes for buttermilk pancakes in your search results. That's because those pages are marked up with a special language that Google has gotten all these different search engines to agree to. They proposed it to the W3C. And now the, the IMDB, Wikipedia, they automatically mark up their entities and their relationships with these tags. Um, and Google basically proposed this for civic services, saying that if health, human, or social services are marked up on web pages using these tags. We'll be able to know that this is the organization that provides this service at this place. These are the hours of operation. We might even be able to sign people up for uh, appointments, things like that. Who knows what is possible? Um, and that was the opportunity we needed to basically say, um, we can take a new approach to this problem because there's already a standard set for getting this information on a web page. Um, the other key thing that emerged was o uh, Code for America developed the Ohana API. Um, this was in tw also in 2013. It's basically like, um, it's, pretty, it's pretty simple. Uh, if you have resource directory data, you can load it into the Ohana API, which is like a web platform, uh, and make it available to anyone. Um, and uh, the challenge with this was it worked in a couple of cases. For San Mateo County, there's now like a really nice looking web page that shows you all the different services in San Mateo County. There's also an API so that people can build like an SMS locator app or they can bring it into their own web, web, website, whatever it may be. The challenge is, as we discovered, um, if you don't have the means to produce this information in the first place, the Ohana API isn't really going to help you. Uh, it was nice to have an API as an example of what APIs are. 
Um, but we were still addressed and needing an answer to the question of how are you going to get the many different organizations that manage this information in the first place to cooperate? So we formed Open Referral to try to answer that question. The idea is that we would develop a common language that would actually cooperate between the pre-existing and emerging competing standards. That 211s and the old school conventional referral providers have their own data standard for structuring information to share between call centers. And Google has now set a new standard for publishing it on the web. So we're going to develop a, an exchange format that bridges these two that can translate between different systems, no matter um, which sort of school or province or domain they come from. Uh, the idea is you map your own internal language about who provides what services to this language once, um, and now you can communicate with any other system. Um, so that was only a necessary but not sufficient step. This is, I think, where we need to go. So we've developed a common language. We've gotten agreement from different players to say this is a, vi a plausible, if not viable, uh, sh standard that we could share. Um, but what we need is the infrastructure that can enable different kinds of information systems to be exchanging this information in real time. Um, I'm going to come back to this. Uh, we're not there yet. I think we can build it here in New York. But along the way, I'll just talk a little bit about a process. The most important thing that Open Referral does is create space for people to come together and, and diagnose these problems and try to find new ideas. So I mentioned that a community of practice is really important. We have uh, social workers and technologists and policymakers and funders um, in our network. We started that process of developing that language by gathering people together and having them listen to each other having them just like walk through their own experience of this problem um, in detail. And for a lot of people, it was the first time that they'd ever heard somebody else who, who, for whom they develop these technologies talk about the experience of looking for services or of managing databases. Um, and that was actually, this is where this vision emerged from, was from two days of conversations about the nature of this problem, um, what would be a potential solution. So the idea is that we would form small, actionable projects in local, pilot, in local communities where we get those diverse perspectives together from community anchor institutions like Bread for the City, where I worked, to government uh, agencies that may or may not have a direct role in providing services or providing referrals, um, uh, alongside funders and alongside uh, technologists, that we would actually have them use this language that we developed to try to solve their own problems. Again, we're not ignoring that logic that the XKCD cartoon put out, which is like, if you put out a language that could be a standard, people aren't going to use it unless it solves their problems. And so we have to actually broker those value propositions in which Information about who provides what can now flow between institutional boundaries across technological boundaries using this language. Um, and the idea is that it will be adopted if it's valuable to people. So we have to find those values. Here are some examples of uh, who's already adopting it. iCarol is actually the largest provider of call center software um, in the market. They have about a third of all the 211s and fully a half of all crisis calling centers. Um, uh, crisis text line, uh, which is blowing up. Um, they are sort of like a text-based uh, um, collaborator with call centers. Uh, and they're like, we need, we need information about services to refer people to who are using our text line. Um, I'm going to talk about one particular pilot project in particular. Um, so Purple Binder. This is one of those 12 emerging startups in Chicago. They provide um, software for social workers, basically. Health insurance companies pay them, uh, and, and large hospitals pay them so that the frontline workers will have a tool that they can use to organize who they're referring people to and where. All that data was previously trapped within this private um, software that was paid for in part by public funding. They've used our language and our API. This is actually from an older version of this deck. Oof. Um, <laughs> uh, they've used our language to develop a front-facing search. So anybody can query this information from uh, a basic website. But they've also used it to publish to another local app that emerged in Chicago called mRelief. 
Emerald Relief uh, enables you to very quickly sign up for food stamps. And if you're not eligible for food stamps, Emerald Relief queries Purple Binders database and turns, uh, returns you information about services that you can go uh, and get that might meet your needs. Um, they also use it to power the Chicago Health Atlas which is for researchers. It shows you census data and population health indicators, and it also now shows you directory data from Purple Binders API. So this is, this is, this is a, a, a win. It's a, a view of the ecosystem in action. Um, however, it's not the ultimate success story. Um, because again, that's one organization that's pretty centralized, that's managed to capture the market of Chicago, and they're opening up. Um, it's a one-to-many success story. But I think what we need are uh, solutions that are many to many, that enable organizations that might have overlapping, uh, in some cases diverging perspectives um, and mandates uh, to essentially cooperate on managing this information. Um, and so we are going to, we're finding the right place to prototype Basically, like sometimes I call it the registry. Um, we could also call it the toolkit. Uh, the idea is that it enables organizations like Purple Binder, but also like Two on One, to be able to cooperate on aggregating this information, uh, resolving conflicts between the information from different sources, and republishing it, uh, republishing updates that information in a way that complements the existing infrastructure. Um, and just like a little bit on, on the stakes here. Um, obviously, we're trying to help people uh, find services more readily wherever they may be. Um, we're trying to help service providers do more effective work with the limited resources that they have. Um, and we're also trying to make it easier to uh, understand what programs are working and what programs are needed. Um, there's a lot of talk about data-driven evaluation, but if there are not common records of record about who provides what services to where, I'm not really sure how you can collect meaningful feedback from multiple sources about um, what's being effective uh, over time and, what, and what, it, what gaps have yet to be met. Um, and as someone who's from Miami, Florida, where like, our homes are already facing floods, this is like a really urgent issue, being able to get control collective control over the information about what is being provided to whom and how to access that is honestly, it's a, like a collective life or death situation over the next 20 or 30 years. And I think that we should be uh, imagining ways to solve this problem that um, invert the old logic about essentially just uh, whatever happens, happens, and to the victor go the spoils. Uh, we need to find solutions that actually work for everyone. So that's too much for now, and I will pause there and we'll take some questions. Thanks. All right. Noel, do you, do you want to start with, Noel, Noel warned me that he has hard questions for me. Do you want to start, or should uh, we take some, uh, get I, a sense first of First, I want to compliment you on getting that done in under my alarm. OK. Uh, <laughs> we're all sorry that we can't hear the special sound that I had. And I also want to say thanks for addressing the concerns that I had. Uh, from the hard questions. I think you brought them up. I mean, some of the fears that I have are how, how does this actually get accomplished, right? Uh, we've seen healthcare record laws, or we've seen the e-medical record paradigm come and go. Uh, and, you know, the whole context was, let's create email for healthcare records, and where, where does that sit? Um, so how do you go about, short of being Google, uh, that has kind of financial and political power to bring about something called GTFS. Mm -hmm. um, how does a um, upstart, yeah. uh, startup, uh, nonprofit entity-ish, uh, get open referral introduced and get the buy-in from entities that yeah. would allow for that, you know, for open referral to exist? Yeah. I want to be clear, in Silicon Valley, where I spent a fair amount of time over the last couple of years, the conventional wisdom is that it's not possible. Like, uh, like, this is not thought to be a conversation worth having among certain kinds of technologists who consider themselves to be very savvy individuals. They think it's not, and, and I think, uh, to correct them only slightly, I think what they really mean is that it's hard, right? 
Um, and I don't think that we have a context in the, in like the recent past since the, the arrival of very cheap and very fast technology has really changed things. We don't have a context for engaging in hard, collective, multi-stakeholder work to build things like infrastructure. Um, and so to an extent, you know, I don't have a formula. Um, I think we do have practices from other situations, things that work in situations where there are vulnerable resources that need to be managed by people figuring out how to work together across institutional boundaries. Like, these things are possible. Um, and so I think that's what we're trying to figure out is uh, get, how do we get to a world where simple things are simple and a complex undertaking like this is possible. And I can get a little bit into this, but I want to hear what other folks have to say. And yeah, so talking about technology a little bit, the way that the boys will be in the quota world kind of interesting to play into all of this. I mean, we kind of get lost in the state of technology. And last time I checked, you know, computers don't have the power of reasoning. Yeah. I mean, I'm struck by the fact that you know, these NYC groups are going to be all over the city sooner later. And let's face it, as human beings, we're always going to talk. We're always going to communicate. Yeah. So where is the, the, the power of like internet protocol where I can talk to my phone and, and get a response yeah. from the intelligent being that a computer is? And, and I mean, I can walk out of the and get hit by a car today and yeah. just be able to pick up and you know, the information from the, the software that you present to be able to tell me where there's hospital. We haven't got to that point. We've been over that. Yeah. We've gone past that. We haven't gotten to that simple point. You just mentioned that things like that could happen. It happened like, you know, that's what I'm, I'm struck by. And I think this is like, this is a real difference between considering this problem from this vantage point versus considering this problem from, say, the mid 90s when they first designed 211, right? Which was like, you build a call center back then, and, it, and it's a pretty good answer to the question. And I think now we have a situation where technology is making new things possible like every month, right? And the, that's why an approach like this that says this information that everyone needs should be available to everyone to use in various ways, what we're really saying is like somebody out there has a great answer for what you can do with VoIP and this data, right? And we don't want it to be up to the individual organizations themselves that have various ad hoc business models to figure out what that answer should be themselves. We want to make this information available to an ecosystem of organization services and people that can use it in new ways. So, you had one there, and then you had the second lady over here. Oh, so I've always said to you specifically that I think I really think that the libraries are kind of the best place to. Lauren, can you, can you introduce yourself? Hi, I'm Lauren Camino. I'm a librarian in Queens. Um, you know, because when computers were still taking up entire rooms, a woman created a language that would organize all of the information about a book and make it searchable. And now every single library in the world that has a computer system uses MARC records and has continually. We're really good at standardizing data and making it open and available. And I think if we could make this a thing that libraries could do, I think that we as a profession would build funding. I, the issue becomes funding. So we collect this information, we have it, we've got booklets, and I you know, have an app that cleans that helps people find the nearest hospital to where they are, it doesn't have a long time to walk, but, but we don't share it because we haven't gotten the funding. But I don't have money to change over to the new desk, and I don't have, Developer time, you know. So there's a way that, like, say, the systems could do it in New York and see like from there, how does it extrapolate out to the 16,000 libraries in the country? Like, I think we can do that, but it's just not a thing. So a couple of things. I love that Lauren brought this up. It's just a little weird history. Like, Mark was the Mark is the library's data standard. That was the first data standard for community resource directory data. Right? This information was collected by librarians through most of the 20th century. This is like a 100-year-old problem, and for decades and decades, they were the ones to solve it. Right? You went to your library to, to, to go through the booklet of like who does what, and they manage it themselves. Um, obviously, at a certain point, like, it became complex enough and sort of beyond the capacity of libraries and sort of drifted away from that. And I think that's, to a certain extent, like, the detriment of the field because there is, I think, a, a practice in, in library, uh, like, in library world of, like, thinking about how to manage data effectively. Um, to say nothing of the local knowledge that's, that's like, right there on hand. I also want to highlight, like, Lauren uh, developed an app 
by redeploying software that was built in San Francisco uh, by Zendesk for St. Anthony's. Actually, uh, we had a screenshot up um, uh, that was one of the comparisons. Um, Lauren redeployed that software, which was open source, and built Waring Queens, um, which is very easy. If you go to waringqueens.org, it's very easy to like navigate. And it's a great example of a simple way to present this information that, um, that complements, I think, more complex approaches to using this information. You wouldn't get everything you need for all services through where in Queens, but it does get you a certain amount of the way, and it can be the same data that's presented in a simpler way as being used by a social worker and so on. And to your point about resources, Lauren set this up essentially as like an extracurricular activity. Yeah. Right there in Queens, though, there is someone who's paid to manage a resource directory database that uh, it's part of her job and uh, it has much of the organization uh, much of the data that Lauren used whereas elsewhere in the New York Public Library there's someone who makes a 400 page booklet for uh, people returning from prison right that's part of their job and so I think part of our assessment is that far more resources are being thrown at this problem by under-resourced organizations in various contexts than you need to solve the problem itself. They're just all being thrown in these silos that are sort of futile uh, on their own, right? And so what we have to figure out is what is that mechanism that's going to enable us to pool those resources together to enable people to spend less time managing this information and get a better outcome? Rebecca, do you have a question before you? Well, um so I'm curious what your thoughts are on the role of technologists in this, because you mentioned in Silicon Valley this is seen as um, like a no-go conversation, and actually, like, as someone who did service directories for a while, like, I actually am kind of okay with that, because I feel like the, like, the organizational structure is not there yet, like, the kind of the work of convincing nonprofits that this is a waste of energy is not there yet. Um, and so we're just having technologists be like, hey, this would be a great idea. Hey, this would be a great, you know, like over mm -hmm. and over again, and it kind of doesn't go anywhere. Mm -hmm. And so I'm wondering, like, kind of if that's your read. Yeah, I mean, I think um, in these fields especially, unlike in commercial technology and so on, um, there's this curious phenomenon that has all kinds of uh, it's essentially trauma. People who work in these organizations, government and nonprofits, are struggling with jobs that are, are incoherent, right? There's more to do than can be done, um, and they have fewer and fewer resources, and they are essentially victims um, of oftentimes technologists and technology companies, right? These organizations, if you talk to somebody who's been providing homelessness services since the 80s, they, are they will tell you how much worse it has gotten since technology arrived, right? They have been forced to use technologies that were designed essentially by um, banks in their like corporate welfare divisions, and they're oppressed by these technologies. Um, and what we're talking about here, in a way, is like technology harm reduction. It's like, let's get people together and like help them recognize their own agency and then articulate what it is that they really need in a way that the technologists who stand to benefit from contracts and ego like have to essentially listen and respond to that, right? I think we have our, a dangerous script that's being thrown out there, which is that this technology, the script is that like, the internet is magic and geeks are wizards. That is like a recipe for societal collapse, right? <laughs> like we need to check that and flip it and say like, actually these people can build tools, but the owners of those, I mean, the, the logic is there in agile development in a way. It's just like agile development like builds that logic into creating a thing that will go out and get bought, right? Whereas what we need is a process of agile learning that's, that circulates that knowledge around, right? Um, and uh, that's a very challenging thing in the funding environment, which is, I think, looking to Silicon Valley for its cues. Devin, can you intro also introduce yourself? Yeah. I'm Devin. I deployed uh, an autonomous <coughs> application after uh, Sandy, and we organized some service data there. Uh, I guess there, there are a few things I'd, I'd like to address, point out. And the, the main one is that uh, the importance of openness like in the standards process, and that the AIRS standard, the group AIRS doesn't actually own the standard that they purport 
to uh, kind of maintain, and that the standard is actually owned by the LA County Tour One system, light. That's right which behind creates you. a significant amount you of the light that's right behind you. around how this thing, how this this taxonomy for how to categorize services can actually be modified, and that, and I think that 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 when you think about competing standards, you know. It's easy to say, you know, whether a standard's proprietary or it's open, or like how that standard's license is immaterial, but it's, it's very much not material. Uh, it very much is material. That if you have uh, 14 proprietary standards and one open one, the open one has a shot of winning, especially in the technology environment like we see now, where you know people can make apps and there's a separation between server and client. Um, so I want to bring that up, but really what I wanted to say also is that, you know. And then the humanitarian aid space and the disaster space, you know, the amount of information management coordination that needs to take place, you know, the, the, the chaotic nature of that you know, is extremely high. And that and they, you know, they've invested, you know, UNOCHA and you know the International Federation of Crossing the Crescents and all those groups that do things like, you know, refugee camps in Lebanon and they are in uh, yeah. In Jordan and whatnot, you know, they they they've tackled that challenge over and over again. They failed and failed, and they're beginning to succeed now with the humanitarian data exchange project in terms of recognizing that spreadsheets, which I believe there's a spreadsheet guy, yeah, yeah. Uh, the spreadsheet guy, that they're realizing that you know if you want to coordinate information at that level, the more sophisticated the application you use, the the more the less likely you are to succeed. And if we use CSVs as the common language of data that then we can move data around and we can share it in a much more eloquent way. And that like right now I think what I see when I see the nonprofit sector and I see you know kind of the American uh, kind of conception of itself is that like we're in this we're in a, we're in a place of stasis. That if we actually applied the that if we actually thought that we were in a state of disaster and that we applied the logic of disaster management to the situation, which is you know record homelessness is particularly you know in New York City over the last 10 years. Seattle declared that it's in a state of emergency around homelessness and things like that. Then we, we, we could get these institutions that, that maybe we would go around these institutions and organize this data ourselves without asking all these people for permission and participation. And it's, it's really a, a, a question of frame. Like, are we in a status quo right now that like it's hard to shake, or are we in a disaster that needs to be solved using like a tools of disaster? So just to back up and pull out a couple of things that Devin mentioned there that might not have been, um, might have lived by for y'all. Um, there is a standardized taxonomy of all the health and human and social services that are available in the United States. Taxon it's just like all the categories. There's 14,000 terms in this, in this taxonomy. Right? That doesn't mean there's 14,000 different types of services. That's actually tracking like the funding streams and the eligibility requirements. These are food pantries that are available for single mothers right? or whatever it is. Um, that taxonomy is managed by 211 Los Angeles County. They were the first to market with a viable taxonomy. They won the market. They are a nonprofit, but it is their intellectual property. It's like it's licensed to HUD. It's licensed to like every single official referral provider. That sounds crazy, right? Like I have eliminated this from my talks because it's so boring. This taxonomy issue and it's really confusing. But it is like it, it, it's it, it is an example. Like from two on one Los Angeles's perspective, it actually does take human resources. A person I've met her. She's very nice. It takes like that person a lot of time to absorb all this information about funding streams, about evolving conventions for describing services. And I think what Devin is suggesting is like that is the old model of like you, you just you collect all this knowledge into a centralized point and then you push it out right and that it's more effective if we could manage this stuff ourselves right if it were open but i gotta say on the flip side of this um we those of us who believe in potentially open systems have a little bit of a problem on our hands which is to say open is a almost uselessly ambiguous term it is super problematic open could mean all kinds of things um, and uh, you know when we say open referral, like what we're really saying is like, what should that look like? What should it mean? We have to actually discover a viable system because it's not like if you just like put it out there, the crowd will magically be able to figure out how to manage a taxonomy of of all these different kinds of services, right? There do need to be institutional mechanisms in place. There need to be ways of managing quality, right? Those have to be figured out. Um, they won't just happen. Um, and so we do, we, we do have the opportunity to find new, uh, new models, but we also have to be realistic with how difficult it is to build something that's open and sustainable. Uh, I have a few questions. So 
does the standard that's being put forward, is it uh, a semantic web standard? Um, and also, what kind of reception have you had from government agencies? Um, I know that there's been a lot of movement on, um, and this is a related issue, but not the same, is um, electronic health records, the standardization of, of data models between these companies. And the federal government has had some leadership on, on trying to standardize those issues. And is, it, is there any kind of thought about kind of bring those conversations together, for example? Yeah. Um, so briefly, um, I still I get a different answer whenever I ask someone what the semantic web is, um, and so um, like what we've done I think points in the direction of that kind of thing. What we've done is just basically describe service types of information about services and put out instructions for how to format it in CSV files, right? So as basic as possible, right? Um, uh, but the idea is you could take this. You could take information that's formatted as such and then very easily mark it up for your semantic web you know, project or whatever it may be. Um, your other question was about uh, um, like, where is their leadership from this from, on the government side? Um, and so I think from the government's perspective, um, there's like a long and troubled history of like government involvement in standards. And I think the, like, the, the answer here is like government can play an important role in essentially fixing market failures and bringing otherwise competitive and wasteful and chaotic uh, industries around common standards, but it's not always clear what that role should be. And it sort of varies depending on the nature of the thing that's being standardized. And so I would understand from a government's perspective, like it's very different for, difficult for someone in government to say, we're gonna go with open referral now, right? We have a few examples of people adopting it. We can explain what we're doing, we have documentation, but it's very difficult for a government to say, like we're gonna do this thing, we're gonna order people to do this thing that's like untested and new. Um, however, government could put out information that could be transformed into this format. Um, it could also convene stakeholders around this conversation and say, we all have common purposes, we all have common needs, so let's figure it out. It can sort of like assert that standards should exist. Um, and, and even allocate resources to help with the things like deliberation and facilitation and research um, that aren't going to be allocated by the market itself. Um, does that answer your question? Yeah, so. so oh, is you, anything happening? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> right. Uh, yes. Uh, yeah, I mean, so, right, to, to that point, like, there are a couple of. Uh, young, smart people who are in the federal government who are like working with agencies to publish better data and a couple of whom have used our specification to actually f like wrap their heads around like what is this problem and they report back, it's really useful. And I'm like, great, can we tell that story? And they're like, oh no, 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 no. <laughs> like, <laughs> I'm like, they're like, we cannot say that we've adopted the open referral format, right? So like, I I'm still figuring those politics out, right? How to get the air cover, uh, f like for, per uh, how to get permission mission for government to do a thing that would benefit people even though like it has to some extent like it, it has boxes that it has to check or whatever the hell. Um, I think we do have more opportunities in local uh, and, and even state governments, right? We have the opportunity for governments to say, we should be publishing a common set of uh, data types about our services, um, and we've seen a lot of potential here. I also, on that note, I, I said I would talk about New York City, and I haven't, and I haven't really. You, you, you have four minutes until we have to start the cleanup. Okay. Um, I think we have a great opportunity here in New York City, and we've received a lot of enthusiasm from not just Civic Hall, but also people at 311, uh, people at the mayor's office, who get where this is going and think it's a good idea. Um, uh, which is not, you know, uh, it's not to commit anybody to anything, but I would say that we have an almost unprecedented opportunity here in New York City, in large part because of infrastructure built under the Bloomberg administration. Um, 311 is really a, a, a leading system uh, in the field of 311s, uh, New York City 311 is one of the best, and they manage information about every single government service, uh, which is unusual. I have not found many other governments where anybody is collecting all the information about all the government services in one place. And 311 does a really good job of keeping track of which governments, uh, which government agencies provide what services to whom. They don't really go outside of that. Right? They don't go far outside of like government services. And in New York, they, it is somewhat unusual. It is like DC in that there isn't a nonprofit 211. 
Um, the 211 is just a part of the 311 system. If you call 211 here, you get New York City 311. Um, and so we have an opportunity to build on this, basically this platform, um, which has all the information about every government service. And the other exciting thing is that Bloomberg also streamlined all of the contracting for every health and human service across every mayoral agency into one system called HHS Accelerator. Um, so, and, and we have some folks uh, who you know, are in the room, maybe we'll get to talk to them after when everything's broken, but basically there's an opportunity here. It wasn't built for this purpose, HHS Accelerator. It was built to streamline contracting. Uh, but they have at least a baseline of information about every single organization that receives a contract from the city to provide a health or human service. Um, and so we can work with these government agencies and with nonprofits to essentially figure out how can we leverage these pre-existing infrastructural assets, um, which were designed for other purposes. How can we repurpose them to something that's actually going to meet uh, a critical mass of different kinds of stakeholders' needs? So hopefully we will be finding the opportunity to do that here over the next year. Great! Uh, Sat Can you start off the question before I fill out? Oh, yeah, okay. You we, question. You could just help me out. Just post this, I want to post this one thing that you had up there while we're cleaning up. That's which, okay, which one? So, yeah. uh, so come talk to him uh, afterward. Um, we have 10 minutes uh, left to kind of clean up and reorient this room. Uh, before we go, I just want to say thank you very much for uh, uh, coming to our first lunchtime beta talk. Um, the butterflies are definitely out of my stomach. Uh, thank you very much. Um, sadly, thanks, thanks. Uh, that's five dollars. Um, uh, sadly, uh, the, I have been notified that the water has yet to be turned back on. So um, infrastructure, infrastructure issues, and that's due to um, you know speaking about infrastructure. New York City's infrastructure is actually very delicate. Um, so there was a uh, water main break that happened, a uh, sewer pipe that needed to be fixed. And the only way to do that is to shut off the building's water. Um, so if you saw the crane collapse, you, I don't know if you heard, but there was like water main ruptures and gas main ruptures. So you know, New York City's infrastructure, uh, uh, physical infrastructure is actually a very delicate thing. Uh, if you take the L train, you know too much about that. Um, uh, we would love to talk about infrastructure and uh, open data technology. Um, and, and design and how design kind of like interplays with all these things through these beta talks. Uh, I'm going to send you all uh, a, a survey uh, just to kind of like start the process to have a better understanding of what are the things that you want to hear. Uh, we're trying to cater these lunches to professionals uh, who are in government who can take time and bake this into their operations as well as uh, you know design and technology people who uh, have the luxury to do this. So um, as well as parents uh, who so they can be accommodated to come and hear these things. So anyway. We want your feedback. Uh, that's the most important thing. Uh, and the second most important thing is we hope to see you at School of Data. Uh, and uh, you, you know, if you have an idea for a 45 minute long session, uh, my ears are open, as the Ferengi say. So uh, nanu nanu, um, uh, thank you for coming. Uh, and we look forward to seeing you at the next one. So thanks for coming. Y'all can reach me at bloom at openreferral.org. <laughs>